Um, so welcome everyone. My name is Claire. I'm filling in for Elliot this month while he takes a very well-deserved vacation. So for anyone who is new or attending this call for the first time, we hold this industry-wide call every month for companies all along the value chain of the cultivated meat industry. And so the purpose of these calls is to bring solutions providers into the same room with others in the cultivated meat ecosystem with the end goal of establishing new collaborations between companies who are already in the cultivated meat sector um, with those developing technologies or providing services that will help to accelerate the industry. If your group is interested in presenting on a future call or if you're working with another company that may benefit from being on these calls, uh, please feel free to reach out to Elliot who normally hosts these calls um, and he can get you set up with that. Um, a few housekeeping items. We have um, our 2022 grant program uh, application period open right now. So those are due on June 3rd. And we have uh, several different uh, priority areas that we're looking for, as well as an, op an open application for um, sort of a wide range of, of solutions in the cultivated meat space. We're hiring a senior scientist in bioprocessing to help us answer questions related to scale up of cultivated meat as well as to fermentation scientists and a director of science and technology. So if you know anyone who might be a good fit for any of those roles, um, please do let them know that they're available and encourage them to apply. And then lastly, Dr. Peter Stogios will be presenting a webinar later today about his work on growth factors for cultivated meat and seafood. Um, and with that, um, let's get into it. So for today's speakers, I'm pleased to welcome Eric Schreibman from MTI Bioscience, who will speak about MTI's continuous thermal sterilization processes. And uh, next, we'll hear from Moti Korin from Optium, who will speak about uh, Optium's AI platform to accelerate cultivated meat uh, production processes. And so with that, um, I will turn it over to Eric. I, I will only be doing a short introduction to hand it over to the true presenter, which is Dr. John Miles. Uh, he is president of Microthermics and MTI Bioscience, uh, manufacturers of small scale uh, thermal processing uh, equipment uh, with over 30 years of experience. Uh, he received his doctorate from NC State University in thermal processing, and I will hand it over to him. Good morning, everybody. I'm going to uh, share my screen. You don't need necessarily need to be looking at me all that much. Um, but uh, thank you, Eric. Can everybody see the screen okay? But uh, to give you a little bit of my background, I worked at the NC State Department of uh, Food and Bioprocessing um, for a number of years. I got my, uh, my PhD in, in food engineering and my degree work was all in continuous flow thermal processing, continuous flow sterilization, pasteurization, how you apply these processes, how you quantify them and measure them and optimize them. So um, this, this, and, and that's what MTI Bioscience is here to do. So I'll give you a um, kind of a bit of a rundown of, um, of what, what we're covering. And the, the, the whole title here is, is a mouthful. Um, it's how production of cultured meat and proteins, and I say proteins because Meat is protein, and the same technology is going to be used for a lot of these things. Um, and uh, so it's going to be the meat and proteins will benefit from continuous flow thermal sterilization and viral inactivation. So these fall under abbreviations that basically are UHT, CTS, or HTSC. And we'll touch a little bit, a little bit on those earlier. But the basic idea of all these is the same. And uh, we'll get to that in just a minute. Um, all right, so the, uh, the first question is, where does cultured meat come from? You know, when, when we're talking about it, uh, and I'm kind of preaching to the choir here, but my, my goal is to kind of set the stage. Um, it comes from the manufacture of mammalian cells up to a scale that produces meat. Um, and they can come from many, many different sources. So we can have chicken meat and fish and and a lot of different types of meat as well as beef. So um, it's really quite significant. Um, it's a growing technology, um, both in terms of the pun, meaning we're growing things, but also it is becoming very popular, very well-funded, 
and it's expanding. Um, and it applies uh, biotechnology and tissue culture to ultimately what must become a very highly cost competitive commercial scale. Um, and it's a very interesting mix of the, the tissue culture and biotechnology uh, field and what is actually biopharm in some circumstances um, into food. And food is, is very high volume, low margin, very tight price controls. Um, so it, it's, it's kind of taking a technology which is really, really great in the lab and in one industry and now refining it significantly into another industry. But to set the stage, um, you know, what we're, what we're really doing is we're taking cells of some sort deliberately harvested from an animal and treated to grow into a stem cell or a cell that we can use to, to literally transform into a meat cell, a tissue cell for muscle. We're growing it in a bioreactor and, and then structuring it so that we have a, a texture and a look and a feel that's like meat. Um, and that's very important because people are, for, for, in, for food, for intake, people are amazingly picky. Um, some folks will pick something up right away and other people can be very picky. So we, we wanna go a long way towards making it uh, seem what, like what they're accustomed to. Um, and the idea, excuse me, get right ahead there. The idea is that um, these technologies have to be refined to a stable and durable manufacturing operation and processes at a much larger scale than experienced previously. And I don't know how many people in this uh, conference have been in a large food manufacturing facility to give them a rough idea of scale, but it's not uncommon to be operating at anywhere from 2000 to 10,000 gallons per hour through a processing facility for fluids, for example. Um, and that's, a, that's a not uncommon, it's much larger. So those processes also have to be running stable all day, day in, day out, so that all of the, uh, the cost containment and the profits can be maintained properly to keep it all growing the right way. So um, that's where this ultimately has to go. Um, this is gonna require really large amounts of sterile high quality media to support the growth of meat tissue cultures to the proper size or manufacturing scale. And what that means is it's a continuous flow process all of itself of its own to a significant degree um, with the output of meat tissue cultures. Now, the important part where MTI bioscience is, is the media for these cultures, and I tr I've tried to outline it here, the media, we're not, we're not worried about the cells themselves or the technology of transforming or texturing the cells. What we're concerned with is getting the media into the right condition for use. And so what this means is a, a gentle sterilization and often the removal or inactivation of viruses that would otherwise disable culture activities. In other words, it keeps the cells from growing or kills them um, or contaminates the, the, the entire culture. Um, so that we can keep operating the right way. And the challenge of these things can be quite significant. Um, I, the, the challenge is, for example, if we end up with a mammalian uh, cell culture uh, viral infection like MVM, this can take down entire production lines and facilities because it's a pernicious and difficult um, challenge to meet. So it's important as we're going forward that we get these things into place using techniques that, that are closed system techniques that keep them right where we want them to be. Now, traditional methods of sterilization and virus removal are, are there for really good reasons. Um, filtration and separation techniques are extremely gentle. Um, that means the media has virtually no impact from contact with those things. And so that we can sterilize and remove the viruses by simply filtering. And I say simply because it, it's not really all that simple. It is, it's fairly complicated and it requires a very careful process to do it. The challenge that, and again, it is very successful. The challenge that these techniques face is they're not validatable. They can't be validated in real time. If we have a filtration technique being used, then we can filter our media 
But on an ongoing basis, we don't know if something's gone wrong with that filter, that perhaps it's it's not being as, as fine a filter as it needs to be, and we have contaminants coming through the other side. We don't know that because there's no way to measure that. The result means that we, we can filter a whole batch, and at the end of that, we need to send that filter out for validation to make sure that it actually is working as it should. And then once, once that's determined, that whole process can be released. Um, I'm sorry, the entire batch can be released. And that's a very important step because there's a lot of downline operations that have to go on to produce these, these proteins and meats. Um, so it's important that from a virus removal and sterilization step, there has to be a validation step, which is discrete and it's offline. So that's one of the most significant challenges of, of uh, viral and sterile filtration. Um, some of the others are strictly the physical limitations. For example, they can't be used for suspensions or emulsions or viscous products. Fair is fair. Uh, everything has to get through the, uh, the filter, which is fine. These media are very good, but it does mean we have to be very careful how we're using them. Um, often it requires what I'm referring to as polishing filters to, that take out the larger debris that we don't want to be dealing with in the finer sterile or viral clearance filters. Um, so that we can keep those running as long as possible. Now, these filters are not inexpensive, so they're a cost factor for sure. Um, and one of the other factors is clogging may occur. And so unfortunately, when you're in a manufacturing operation where you want to know everything that's going on, you don't want to have something unplanned happen. And this particular uh, issue can be a big challenge to cost control. Uh, and that will be something that has to be gotten in control so we don't have unplanned significant production downtimes. Um, it's important to point out that filters can interact with the media. That's more often worked around without too much trouble, but it's important to point that out. Um, and of more recent development is the idea that filters or any other consumables may be in short supply. Um, and uh, we're working with a number of clients who are finding that they're having a hard time to get their, their filters, and that's a big deal. Having a consumable that you rely on that falls into short supply is not a way to contain costs. So that's a challenge. Um, so kind of summarizing, the production scale for cultured meat and protein really increases the importance of operations that are gentle, scalable, and can be validated in real time. Um, I put this in for us to keep an idea of scale of what we're talking about for size. Um, it's always interesting when you start to get down to the size of viruses and you compare it to blood cells and things and we start to understand really how small things are. Um, but in the end, the result needs to be meat that looks, smells, tastes, and has the same texture and nutrient content as traditional meat. With the main objective of all of this is to have less environmental impact than the traditional meat production. So that's a very tall order. So as we're moving this technology into a truly really full and, and well-established and economical production scale, there are a lot of metrics that we need to be watching. So in commercial scale, um, the interesting part is the most important need may not be the technology itself. In other words, the ability to manage and manipulate the cells may not be the biggest challenge it's probably cost and it pushes technology towards continuous flow processes. And that's very, very common. If you've got a batch operation, if you really wanna make it uniform and save costs, you go to continuous process. So now not to confuse things, whether culture meat is created by batch or continuous methods, you know, that specific technique there is, is an important factor, but either way, the most important factor is that these processes are supplied with properly sterile and virus-free media, media of high and stable quality. So no matter how we're sterilizing that media, it's got to be consistent quality and stable. Um, that's, that's a big deal. And the media has to be in easy supply. We don't want to be slowing down because media is in short supply. So however we're producing that sterile and virus-free media, those techniques should be ones that we can keep up on a long-term basis. So where does MTI Bioscience fits into this? Well, we design, build, and support 
continuous flow thermal processors or processing systems for viral inactivation as well as rapid sterilization. This is what we do. We don't do them at massive production size. There are a lot of companies who already do that. We do it in scales where you can actually set your processes up. You can do a lot of work literally in your lab or in your pilot plant and scale it up even further. Some of our systems actually can be used to feed um, some of the more continuous fermentation methods because they don't tend to have as large a throughput. But um, we specialize in what we call thermal process evaluation. And that's what we use to develop thermal processing equipment and conditions to optimize media performance. The idea is it's always a trade-off between the assurance level, which is our confidence of the sterility or viral clearance against the quality of the media. And it doesn't matter what you're doing, that's always the same consideration. Um, and it's important to point out that this is not meant to replace filtration, but to work with it and provide higher levels of process and safety assurance. Because when we're going to these large scales, if you have a day's production go down, you have a big problem. So where does MTI Bioscience come from? How did we start? Um, MTI Bioscience is, is a sister company of Microthermics. Um, Microthermics was family owned since 1989. Um, it's basically the food and beverage division of the overall company. Uh, we're headquartered in Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, years ago, we began having a lot of companies come to us looking for equipment to do this work. And as we worked with them, we realized they had a little bit more specialized requirements. And so we created MTI Bioscience as the biotech, biopharm, and biopharmaceutical division for microthermics to answer those specific technical as well as sales and marketing needs. We have microthermics itself has equipment both in biotech, biopharm, all over the world, um, tremendous amount in the food industry. Overall, we've got, I think we've got about 2,800 pieces of equipment in 42 different countries. Um, the, we've got a lot of equipment in different universities, uh, Cornell, Penn State, UGA, uh, University of Laval, Unicamp, University of Sao Paulo, I won't read the list, but there's a lot of equipment out there in the field. So we've been doing this for a long time and we, we work hard at making sure we help companies understand what they're doing. Um, and we work to maintain solid relationships uh, because we've got a lot of companies who's, who's purchased multiple systems. And if you consider a lot of our equipment is either in manufacturing or in R&D, we're under non-disclosure agreements out the ears, which uh, our sales and marketing team would dearly love to not have to work against. But um, we, we work very carefully to make sure companies know they can work with us in confidence. Um, so what's a continuous thermal sterilizer? It's a continuous flow process operating a constant flow and steady state. Media is pumped under pressure so that it doesn't boil because we're sterilizing here through a set of heat exchangers to heat it rapidly and cool it rapidly. The critical sterilization step is the time that the media flows through a tube right in the middle of the process that's long enough to create the desired exposure time. The tube's called a hold tube so if we're heating up to 138 degrees C, we wanna have perhaps five seconds. The tube is long enough that that fluid takes five seconds to get through. So it, it's sterilized before we cool it. And of course, this equipment gets sterilized before we start. So as we're going forward through sterilizing material, it retains sterility as it exits the equipment. The systems range in size from lab laboratory size to pilot plant and production. Um, the equipment design itself and the settings we use, the operating conditions, determine the thermal exposure. And that's really the nice part because the thermal exposure is what determines the, the quality of the media. And in this kind of equipment, it's independent of batch size. If you're in a reactor, the size of the reactor and the amount of fill of the reactor determines how long it takes to heat up and cool down and everything. And that changes that thermal exposure. Um, so scale up is a challenge, but when you're in a continuous thermal sterilizer, it scales up much more easily. What's a viral inactivation system? Well, to be clear, it's basically the same as a continuous thermal sterilizer, but it's run at lower temperatures. So we're, we're, not, we're not doing as much to the media, but we're definitely precisely aiming the thermal process at 
the uh, the organisms we're looking at. So how does this process process work? Well, looking at these systems, if we think of them, hang on, this is going a little quick. If we look at these systems and think of them as one long pipe, that at one end we have an inlet pump and then um, a gauge here and a back pressure valve to maintain pressure in the pipe because we're going to go above the boiling point. So if we start with that pipe and then we add some heaters so that now we have two heaters to warm the product up and get it up to the final temperature and then a couple of coolers to cool it down. So now we're, we're doing things in a long pipe that has all of this and we add a hold tube and the hold tube makes sure it's hot enough in the middle. In this case, what we're actually doing is we're building a process this way that actually builds the thermal exposure that that media is going to see. And so whenever we run the media through this, and no matter how long we run the media through this, it's going to see this exact same thermal exposure. So it gives it a tremendously uniform thermal exposure that is actually much shorter and more gentle than what's done in a batch operation. So if we're looking at, at sterilization, let's look at this very briefly. The, uh, the, the bright green line here would be a smaller vessel, for example, that we put together as a model, but you're talking about exposures that take a long time. It's not unusual to be coming up to temperature, at temperature and cooling down for an hour. Um, there's a lot of time involved. Now, there are shorter processes, there are longer ones, but this gives us a rough idea of scale. And this typically runs at about 120, 121 degrees C. When we look at a continuous thermal sterilizer, that's this gray short peak at the very beginning. And the reason why it's so much shorter is when we go to the higher temperatures for sterilization, the sterilization time becomes very, very short. And here's the example. If it takes us five minutes at 121 to fully sterilize the product, and this is an example for some products, for some media, it might be eight minutes, but this is just a good working example. When we go up 10 degrees C, that becomes a half a minute. If we go up another 10 degrees C, it goes down to five hundredths of a minute or three seconds. So it changes as a, as a logarithmic function. And if we go all the way to 151, which is kind of challenging, it goes down to 0.3 seconds. So as we go up in time, uh, up in temperature, the time decreases exponentially. What that means is the time to sterilize the media is actually short enough that we don't damage the media as much as a lower temperature, longer time process. Now, let's look at scale up. Um, continuous thermal scale, sterile up as, as scale up, as well as HTST for viral inactivation, always maintains the, th the same thermal exposure. So for example, if you have a, a smaller system in the laboratory, for example, it's built and it has a specific time temperature history or thermal exposure. When we go to the pilot plant, we can build another system that actually does exactly the same thing and when we go to larger production scale, the same thing is, is true there. So that that way you can maintain your quality because you've maintained the same thermal exposure. Um, another important point about this is if you're working in the laboratory and you do, let's say you say, we need 50 liters of this media. And then, you know, two days from now, somebody says we need 200 liters. It doesn't mean you need a whole new system. You just process longer. A good example is if you have a system that, that operates at a rate of a liter per minute, in, in an hour, you've processed 60 liters. If you need to get more media, 100 liters, then you run for 100 minutes. So it's easy to go to larger batches before you have to go to another piece of equipment and make that investment. So in the end, it's important to remember that the media flows through a constant time temperature exposure. That's this. And it's the same regardless of the process scale, all right? The characteristics of these kinds of processes, I said they're continuous flow, low overall heat exposure than batch processes, and they're optimized to produce the highest quality with the highest efficiency. That's a very important part. They deliver the same thermal exposure regardless of batch size, so you've got good consistently. It's easy to scale to higher or lower throughput, 
and they're more energy efficient than batch thermal processes because they can be integrated with a lot of other um, methods to retain that energy. The technologies of these processes have been around for a long time in the food industry over 50 years. And if you want to get a picky uh, group of, of uh, ways of judging the quality of something, you make things for 300 million people in this country and you'll find out how picky picky can be. Um, these processes are very commonly used in growing microbial media um, and they're working their way very well into a lot of other industries. Um, the key to adoption is R&D with the right equipment. When you start at the beginning, you start working to optimize what you're working with and figure out the best way to maybe split up your formula for your media, sterilize one part one way, another part another way, or however you need to do it, but do it with the right equipment to begin with because that sets your scale up from there on in. It means 10 years from now, if you need to do scale up, with you need to scale up a new media, you've already got the equipment and the operating conditions established to do that. Um, using these kinds of processes for viral inactivation by HTSD has been very well researched. Um, it's at lower temperatures than sterilization because it, a lot of times the media can't tolerate the higher temperatures, excuse me. <clears throat> but that all began in earnest after several major cell line failures and uh, treatment shortages in the biofarm area. Um, so there are a lot of companies now using this HTST technology to inactivate viruses for viral clearance. And it's, it's actually fairly common now. A um, number of years ago, Merck did a, a study where they looked at continuous flow sterilization and literally built a system from the ground up, designed from the ground up to judge its suitability for the biopharm sector and biotechnology. And they came out with all of what we've been saying, energy conservation, a more gentle process, um, more uniform heat process. So it was, it was a very, very good study. And the important part was that was done by a biopharm company. So that it's not, not the food industry saying it, it's a biopharm company with all of the detailed requirements of biopharm. And this is what they determined. There are a lot of applications of CTS all the way from uh, parenteral fluids all the way down to milk and simple products. Um, and it really comes down to how you develop your products, you research your stuff and decide, let's use this process. Um, give you a rough idea of what one of our, our systems looks like. We have a lot of different ones. This is an older picture, but inside the system are, we use a coil style heat exchanger. So it actually does represent a pipe so we pump the fluid, the media through these heat exchangers, through the hold tube and through the coolers. And that way it's, it's set for the process and every particle, every fluid element experiences the same process. This kind of process is easily integrated into biomanufacturing where the system itself is, is something you really don't pay a lot of attention to because it's just part of a larger manufacturing scheme where perhaps we're making media for storage that gets stored sterile, <clears throat> or it goes straight into a, bio, into a bioreactor of some sort. What we end up encountering most times is companies want to store media so that they can draw on demand for whatever, other, whatever their other operations are. It can be difficult to link two continuous processes back to back. It's much better to have some sort of a surge capability and storage capability. But we do this kind of work all the time. We've actually had a number of projects with clients who had media that they had split into separate sections because some of the uh, materials in those different sections would not be sterilized well, wouldn't endure sterilization if they were together. So they literally split the, the formula in two and sterilized it in two separate aliquots and would add it together um, quantitatively into the finished tank. Well, we set the system up so it actually did the measuring and calculating for all of that. So when they wanted to process a certain media, they just said, here's, here's the volume of media section one, here's the volume of media section two, go to it. And the system drew from their tank, sterilized media section one, the proper amount got into the tank, then it switched over to the second media component and fed it in 
right behind it so that it was all quantitatively um, put in place. So they had the right media to finish with. Um, so that's one of the features of this kind of process is it's continuous flow, but it's very highly controlled. So if you're running at 10 liters a minute or two liters a minute, it's very tightly controlled and you can take advantage of that. What does this mean for cultured meat? Well, these processes provide a lot of benefits that are needed for competitive commercial production of large volumes of media. So that's really the rub, competitive commercial production. This is where you save on scale up and a lot of other things. We, MTI Bioscience, we're here to provide the services and equipment to support this and optimize these processes to maximize the media performance. And that's a big deal because the media performance itself is really a huge uh, production requirement. So just to give you a quick summary, actual treatment of the media in these processes is, is simple and rapid. Um, the thermal exposure of the media is constant because it's a function of the equipment. Um, it can be optimized, excuse me, it can be optimized. Um, and that's something that's important to do at the beginning. Um, these processes are energy efficient with regenerative heating and cooling. That's a big deal um, because when you get to the large scale manufacturing, the costs of heating and cooling are quite significant. And there are ways of saving significant amounts of energy that aren't going to alter the media quality. Um, validation of the operating conditions. And here's what I made as a big point earlier um, when you're doing a, uh, a filtration process that you have to validate offline and stop. Validation of these processes is done in real time. Um, we're always operating the, the temperatures and the flow rate and the operating conditions. And those things are all alarmed so that we know what's been delivered, it's the right way, and we have the records all to show for it. So validation for these processes is in real time. Um, and here again, scale up is simple because we get the same equipment or we operate for a longer period of time or we build it into the next larger piece of equipment. Um, these technologies are not a replacement filter for filtration. Actually, I've been to a number of conferences and folks say, no, we were not here to replace filtration. This is to add to the higher levels of assurance that are necessary so we don't have high costs at large production scale. And the technology is applicable for fluids and media that can't be filtered. So that's an important part. Sometimes that's the case and there is an alternative. So with that, you know, this is, this is who to talk to. There's Eric is with us. I think if you're getting a copy of this, you've got the, uh, the contact information for us. We're happy to, to set up any calls or answer questions. That's what we do. And uh, thank you very much for your, your time and consideration. I hope I've been helpful. All right, thank you, John, for an excellent talk. Um, we are running a little bit short on time, so um, maybe you can address, uh, there's a couple questions in the chat, maybe you can just type answers to those. Um, so with that, uh, I will turn it over to uh, Moti from Optium. All right, so thank you very much. First of all, I want to thank uh, uh, Elliot, who is not here, and uh, wish him a, a happy vacation, and uh, Rene, and Caroline for inviting me to this event. Um, my name is Moti Cohen. I'm uh, the co-founder and CEO of uh, Optium. Um, I would like to share my screen. Uh, I'm here to talk about the use of art artificial intelligence in the entire cell-based uh, cellular agriculture field in order to make every batch that you produce makes its way to the dinner table. Now, everybody understands so we are talking about the booming market. Everybody understands that we hopefully will get less and less slaughtered animal food in our, in our diet. And basically it translates to the fact that hundreds of thousands of bioreactors will be added to the market. When I'm referring to the word bioreactors, I'm talking to fermenters and bioreactors. So all of the biologists among us that for them it's a dramatic uh, uh, change, please excuse me. But the vehicle, the industrial vehicles that will replace what we are knowing as animal, slaughtered animal production will come to the industry. And this is something we all uh, see um, during the last uh, few years and will definitely expand. 
However, and this is a big however, we are talking about complex multi-layer process. We are talking about a process that comes from the biotechnology industry and it has to be modified and used in the food industry. So the first thing we have to understand is that if it will not have economic value, it will not last. If it will not meet the price requirement of the market, unfortunately, it will not last. And we have to understand, to understand that because of the complexity of the, of the process, any deviation may change something along the way. And we compare it to the butterfly effect where changing the DO on one side may change the cell growth on the other side. Now, that makes it very hard to do adjustment on real time. When you are producing, when you are producing um, the cultivated meat or precision fermentation, you want to know if you can make a change throughout a real time process. However, it's very hard to, to identify it because the deviation are very, very small. Another problem is the high cost I'm talking about. Um, when we're talking about food industry, and at the end of the day, we are transforming biotechnology industry to the food industry, you do not have any room for error. You have to be precise, you have to be optimal in order to make it cost effective and have no errors about it. If the price level will not reduce dramatically, it will simply wouldn't work. Second of all, we are talking about a lot of knowledge. Companies come with a huge amount of knowledge. Experiments done in a laboratory, experiments done in a semi-industrial facility, and then they want to keep the product integrity, the entire knowledge that they came into industrial facility. And here you have a huge barrier of how to translate the data that you already have. How do you keep your original product and original yield, original a, a repeatability that you already succeed in, in having in a full industrial scale. If you do not meet all these requirements, it will be very, very hard and challenging to the industry to penetrate the mass market. Our solution for that is basically an AI solution. We are talking about an AI-based platform that will achieve the maximum result in cellular agricultural production. What do I mean? Let's talk about efficiency. Efficiency is translated to cost at the end of the day. I want to make sure that every ounce of products that I put in my bioreactor will, uh, will uh, uh, work at the maximum level it could work in, meaning maximum yield, maximum efficiency. I have to be repeatable. Repeatability is one of the major things in any food production uh, facility. You don't want to eat today's a burger, whether it's veggie burger, and, and you don't want to eat it today and tomorrow morning you have a different taste of the product. It has to be repeatable. And if it's not repeatable, you want to know as a manufacturer online, how can I make it the same as what I've done yesterday? Predictability. This is one of the core uh, 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 things that you have to understand as a food manufacturer. You have to know how your product will look like. If I'm baking a cake today, I want to know how it will taste at the end of the product. If I'm growing a cell, I want to know what will be the cell growth. I want to know what will be the cell mass. I want to know what will be the texture of the cells. And I want to know it during the production. If I know it during the production, if I can change something during the production, then my predictability would increase dramatically. So how do we do it? First of all, we use, a, a, I will talk about system architecture. Don't worry, I will try not to go into boring a, a computer awards, but I will, do want to give you a glance of how can you use artificial intelligence? How can you use the state of the art science in order to come a, a, along with biological process or biotechnology process? First of all, we look at the bioreactor. We look at the fermenter or bioreactors and we take the sensors that are already integrated in it. And we take all the data that's called time series data. Besides of that, we look at the data that's coming before, during and after the production of the cell, meaning before the cell grows, what is the cell line? What are the pH? What was the specific parameter where it grows? Sometimes you have, and most of the time you would have laboratory result 
throughout the growth of the cell, uh, whether it's in the log phase, the lag phase, you want to know what is the cell growth, you want to know what is the pH, you want to know, sometimes you are giving it to a fax. So you have a lot of results related that are not connected to the bioreactors by themselves. And what we are doing is putting everything in a database. Actually, 80% of what we do is organizing everything in a database. It looks very uh, small in this slide, but this is 80% of the work to make everything fit, to make every slide sees a, a, the other that are a parallel. <clears throat> only then we come with the algorithm, only, only then we come with what we are calling engineering know-how. What do I mean engineering know-how? Uh, when we're talking about cellular agriculture production, whether it will be precision fermentation or a, a, a cultivated meat, you would rarely have a lot of data. Usually you are, you are talking about small amount of data, what's called sparse data. So in order to get the algorithm to get a significant results, you want to bring engineering insight. You want to bring them understanding of knowledge of the process. And this is exactly what we are doing. We are bringing what's called features that I will show a bit later, features to the process in order for the algorithm to actually uh, work better. And only then you can do the prediction and the optimization. So behind this uh, big words, what I'm talking about, what is artificial intelligence capabilities, what the software that I'm uh, here uh, presenting actually gives. Um, the first thing that we are talking about is a real-time analysis and alerts, meaning we are looking at the data in real time and gives alert to the engineers or to the producers where the batch is. Now, I've been a process engineer uh, um, in, in the beginning of my career. I know that you don't want to see a lot of mathematics. You don't want to see a lot of graphs, but you do want to know if something would went wrong and you want to know it in real time. And this is exactly what we have come up with. But once something is wrong, you want to know why. We want to identify what is suboptimal in what you are doing. And may I elaborate on the word wrong? It's not wrong. Sometimes the parameters look amazing, but it will not be optimal. It will be suboptimal, meaning the yield would be changed between 80% to 65%. What's making this happen? What is the correlation between parameters that you look at that makes this suboptimal batch this is exactly what our software provides. And while you are doing it in real time, you can adjust it while the production is, is still there. So if the cells are getting into distress, whether the cell growth is not a, a high enough and you want to know exactly where you are. And you have a prediction. The prediction tell what will be the end product. Let's say, for example, we are talking about cell density. Uh, what will be the cell density at the end of the process? I want to know it, I want to predict it throughout the process. And uh, while if, if I can predict it throughout the process, it means I can change it and then again, go back to the optimum level of what I'm doing. And that's exactly what our product gives. I will go in a glance uh, uh, to a few of the screens that we are showing that to show you uh, what does it mean, all of these uh, uh, um, words of, of algorithms and the uh, uh, architecture. The main screen, what you can see here is basically a dashboard, but this dashboard holds behind him the entire science. You, what you can see here is a gauge that I will elaborate in a second that gives you a score of what is happening in my bioreactor right now. Then you are going to the algorithm phase. The algorithm stage would give you the indication of where the batch is, compared to several algorithms that we're going to run real time. And of course, what you would like to do, to do when you're uh, uh, analyzing it is drill down for the feature, meaning what is the DO right now compared to the temperature, compared to conductivity, and not just compared to each sensor, but the sensor behavior. For example, if I'm talking about temperature and uh, we, we just hear a lecture about temperature, the temperature increase in a specific stage would be a derivative of the, of the temperature. I want to know how it is correlated to the cell growth and whether a, a, a specific stage in the process or a specific day in the cell growth is related to one of these features. And I can see it here in the drill down and I can have a prediction of what is going on, what will happen, what will be the end product of what I'm growing at now. For example, again, uh, what will be the cell density uh, at the end of the process? 
Uh, another additional uh, uh, fantastic feature that we have is actually historical data. Uh, go back to what we said before, we are doing uh, uh, data uh, in a data, uh, data set and organize the data. And by now we can use historical data. This is amazing features that can allow you to uh, understand uh, very deep your process. You can have reports, dashboards, and uh, uh, custom uh, uh, your entire uh, um, process. Now, uh, let me get you in behind the scene. Let me show you what I'm talking about uh, when I'm talking about uh, our platform. So I will run a little uh, video that goes through uh, one discussion. This is the platform actually in real life. You have a real time, a batch score. Behind it, you have a, a score over time. And if you run school as a cursor, it will tell you what was the score in every time. Now, this looks very uh, intuitive, but behind it, there is a, a, a different AI engines that are assembled from different engines and give you what we are calling a dynamic scoring. Why it is dynamic? Because things are not just dynamic by the numbers that change, but the characteristic of the AI changes, meaning each AI engine is weight is different along the way. The batch stage is important, where the cells are in the leg stage, in the log stage. What, what day is it in the cell's life? Uh, is it day five, day four? Can I compare day five to day three? No, I have to make the, the right uh, adjustment. And again, the uh, algorithm looks at it. What is the anomaly grade? Whether it, we are talking about small derivatives, high derivatives, we are talking about a small or big change. Of course, everything is calculated throughout this uh, uh, process. Let me get you into another engine that we are working on. Uh, what we are calling the golden root. The golden root, again, one of the several engines that runs through our system, is a comparison between sensor and sensor behavior to the historical batch, meaning in real time, what you can see is how your sensor look like and how it, 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 it worked in, in the same process at the same stage. Again, I will show you a, a short uh, video. But just to let you know what you are seeing, we are looking at minimum and maximum boundaries. We are looking at actual sensor and what is the standard deviation and what is the average of the past uh, uh, batches. Let me see if it would work here. Yes, yeah, so what you can see here, the software pick the, the specific engines that we are calling a, a golden root. And you can see the sensor behavior. Of course, you can change if you want the sensor. So you can move from one sensor to another. By the way, it's not just sensor behavior, it's sensor feature, meaning I'm not just looking at temperature, I'm looking at temperature behavior. For example, just to, to, for a short example, the temperature uh, uh, average, the temperature uh, slope, uh, derivative, or anything like this. So what you can see here is that the a, a software can run through the process, understand in real time what has been done in the past, what is changed, what is the average, so you can make uh, all the corrections. Uh, I've talked earlier about the analytical uh, tools that we have, the historical data that you can do a lot of filters and uh, gives you a glance of a historical view of what you've done before. And so we've talked about, I would say, the algorithms of what it gives you, but let me translate it to real-time money, real-time value, what is yield when you are talking about uh, and this example is in, in cell culture. Assuming your production uh, uh, would, would verify between 20 to 50%. Why it ver would verify? Because what we've said before, you we are talking about very complex uh, environment. So many interactions, between inter uh, relations between correlations, between parameters that make the cell grow in one way or another. And you, what would you find? We'll find differences in, for example, cell density in, in this example between eight to 20 million cells per milliliter in your ordinary batch. Unfortunately, you wouldn't know why, but you know you have these deviations in yield. With our software, what you will get is by the end of the day, the yield would become 45 to 50%, meaning the expected cell density would go to 18 to 20 million cells per milliliter. So again, the value for money you're getting for your product is, is, is definitely much higher. And we try to see how much money we are talking about. Now, the cultivated meat industry, which is a very uh, exciting industry, 
it's still not in a stage where the prices are something that we can uh, go to the store and actually purchase real uh, um, cell culture meat. But assuming we will go to this price, assuming at the end of the day, we'll talk about $10 per kilogram. Even then, uh, we are talking about $5,000 per batch saving while using the AI tool uh, we are talking about. So we're talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars of saving per year from direct influence of the software. Now, we, what we believe in is that eventually this is a food market that will have a, a price competitive environment. You will not be in an environment when the price is not an issue. You will have to reduce costs and you, there will be no way that you could work with uh, such uh, derivatives in yield, in uh, predictability, predictability or a, a prediction of what you're doing. Now, uh, let me tell you a little bit about myself or where we're coming from. Um, so uh, we are based in Israel, as you maybe guess from the strange accent, but uh, I'm Israeli based, uh, we are Israeli based company. I'm a chemical engineer in my background. My second degree is in biotechnology. And uh, uh, I've been working in a company called MGT Industries in the last uh, few years. In this company, MGT has designed the first industrial facility for cultivated meat. That was a facility that came to us and they actually wanted to have cultivated meat in industrial scale. So when we looked at it and myself and the other co-founders of Optium, we understood that the AI tools that we are talking about or thinking about will be dramatically effective in this type of uh, industries because of the lack of knowledge of uh, scaling up, because of the understanding that the process have to be efficient have to be repeatable and we understand what uh, uh, needs to be done. Um, so again, I'm saying we, uh, most of the work been done by uh, great uh, teams and uh, colleagues. Uh, Amir and Shaha are co-founders to, together with me uh, in the company. Um, that's it. Uh, thank you very much. And if you have any questions, please let me know, I'm here. And you can of course contact me through email if uh, we're, that's my contact information. All right. Thanks, Mati, for an excellent talk. Um, anyone have any questions? We've got a few minutes at the end of the call here. Okay, great. I'm available uh, through uh, email, of course, or in contact. And thank you very much. All right. Thank you both. Um, if uh, both of the speakers could maybe put your emails in the chat just so people have them um, handy. Um, and we have we are about at time so um very very good job on the timing there <laughs> all right great if there are no further questions thank you so much everyone for being right. here thank you, uh, thank you john and Mati, for presenting um and we'll see you next month